Right. So I'll give you a wave about five minutes to go. Thanks very much. I look forward to that. <coughs> right. Good morning, all. Uh, Kevin Booth, Senior Curator, English Heritage, and uh, courtesy of a recent restructure, they generously gave me a couple more counties. So I now go Nottingshire, Lincolnshire, up to Scotland, across through Cumbria, down through Lancashire, and back again, um, which is somewhere around 45 galleries and or historic interiors to look at, one of which is Corbridge, which about three and a half years ago, uh, we got the green light to actually uh, represent the site museum, uh, which had last been done in the mid-1980s when the museum had been built and was itself the culmination of about 80 years' worth of investigation and analysis on that extensive site. Uh, if you're feeling unkind, you might suggest that it shouldn't have taken English Heritage 30 years to represent the museum. But there is an aspect of Corbridge which is typical of a number of the large 20th century archives we look after, which is that really its narrative from the mid-1980s had not changed. Uh, that eight-year process of analysis had published, and that was pretty much it. It's been pretty static since then, and the whopping archive that goes with it had been largely dormant, I would suggest. Um, if you're going to spend £300,000 on a new museum, uh, you might like to do more than simply put a bit of 21st design, century design ethic into it and actually try and do something different, see if there is anything you can say that is new. So we invited uh, a panel of um, august people, that's Lindsay Addison Jones, second right. Um, cut that one, Doug. <laughs> That'll be the last of those. Um, we invited a panel of people who know a lot about Corbridge and a lot about the frontier to come to Corbridge and talk to us about what they considered to be the real significance in the site and in the collection, what were the gems, what were the great stories that we should pick out? What, for me more importantly, were the areas where there might be room for new thinking, some new research, some re-evaluation of the existing narrative? Uh, to which I fed them lots of lovely biscuits and coffee and sat back, folded my arms in anticipation, and they said, ooh, it's a bit difficult, actually. Can't really do anything with Corbridge. That <coughs> archive, you know, it's problematic. Um, you know, well, you know, you can show the lion and a few other things. Basically, they weren't very encouraging. Um, what they could all agree on was that we should definitely talk about the pottery shop. This talk is um, it's chaotic, probably, but... Um, it's about going back to basics. It's about looking at where, what the origins of your narrative, your collection, and your site actually are. What do we really know? How reliable is that received account? It's about looking at the potential in an archive, uh, both the objects, but also, critically, the primary paperwork uh, that goes with it. Um, Yes, that sort of interrelation between the collection and the paperwork is really important. It's about essentially challenging, it's a bit pompous this, challenging the orthodoxy. It's about uh, being difficult. Uh, so I'll look a little bit at the methods that we used. I suggest something of, of the fruits that came out of it uh, and say something about what I hope to be a longer term, much broader benefit of this piece of work. I have to say that what I talk about, I don't think is anything particularly new to anyone on this table. I don't think the approaches are in any way revolutionary, but I think it's just good, sound curatorial practice, and I hope that it's a useful reminder on what these archives can actually still offer. Uh, Corbridge, oh, is there a pointer? There is. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I use it? All the way around? Yeah. Sorry if I'm being really thick. No, you see, I'm being really thick. Right, well, we'll just point it. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> um, that's Corbridge as seen in uh, the sort of AD 70s. The Brickland campaign, I can sound, sound like we're owners. Um, spreading north in, in the 70s, uh, 
getting as far north as whatever that word is, Strakos, yeah. Um, and then falling back uh, in the 80s uh, to adopt the line of the Stain Gate, which is shown on the map below, and variously being a fort which is a bridgehead, supply base, uh, support garrison to the later wall that's constructed, falling out of use as a fort in the probable mid second century, but then having this you know, huge sort of long afterlife as civilian settlement, albeit with significant military presence bang in the middle of the town. With it goes uh, an incredible archive. If we go back, we see one of our star items, the lion, which gets printed on every piece of English heritage publicity, as far as we can see. That's it, just discovered in uh, 1907. Uh, it's a huge archive. It has some really important stuff in it, in terms of thinking about what Dan's just said, it's pottery type series thinking about the, the depth and the wealth of the personal collections, personal artifacts, thinking about uh, it is probably the sort of preeminent sculptural and epigraphic collection uh, in the north of England. Thinking about where I was. We did that. We did that. Um, so there we are. Uh, Corchester, Corstoppleton, Coria. Corbridge, whatever we want to call it, that's, uh, I think, uh, an early view from uh, the Victoria County history. A couple of incursions in the 19th century had established that there really was something of interest here. Uh, in wanting to update the county history volume, uh, uh, an excavation was scheduled for 1906 under the direction of Francis Hallowfield, who we have there in the top right. And I think this is pretty much 1906, and this is pretty much the area that they started working on as Colbridge and the time in the background. Uh, such was uh, the extent and the, and the quality of what they uncovered. They scheduled annual excavations from then onwards, 1907, uh, initially through to 1914, some marvelous characters. Uh, classic sort of uh, early practice of these little mining wagons chumbling around the site, depositing spoil everywhere. I love this character here. Uh, with his chugs. We've been doing a little bit of work in the community seeing if we can identify any of these chaps and one or two are popping up from people's ancestry. World War One interferes. Uh, oh, I should say, you know, this is a sort of uh, quality that they're producing, really quite detailed site plans. And then this overall map of what the, the seven, eight years of, uh, of early excavations uh, recovered. World War interrupts. Um, in the 1930s, the site is gifted, or the central section of the site is gifted to the state by the Beaufort uh, estate. Um, excavations again by Eric Burley in the 1930s, and then again from 1946 onwards, the Corbridge School stretches right through to the early 70s. Um, here they're excavating the Corbridge Hall, another of those iconic uh, artifacts from, uh, from the site, the most complete. Um, representation of Lorica Segmentata, I think, anywhere from the Roman uh, boundaries. So we have over 40 years of excavations across the 20th century. This is the final work in 1980 on the footprint of what became later the museum building. <sighs> One really should keep these more structured. I think the thing to say then is that produces an enormous but deeply problematic archive. Um, the excavators, certainly in the early period, had employed quite simplistic techniques, uh, wall, trace, uh, wall chasing, uh, navvies, local navvies under a sort of semi-professional supervision. Um, Though they did produce, as I've shown, some really quite detailed plans, and if you read their correspondence and read their, uh, their actual published material, you see they understood stratigraphy to an extent and did record artifacts to an extent in that sort of way. Even though the Colbridge School excavations, with their sort of uh, insistence on these square box excavations going bonk, 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 bonk in a grid that never quite seemed to match up between each other, um, their archive is also, is also difficult. The huge collection um, 
when we started this project, it was very, very difficult to relate it to the known archaeology. It's just, you simply couldn't, and you'd have to plow through thousands of shirts to try and come up with that one fine stray that leaked. So, despite quite positive and, 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 and confident estimations of what Coalbridge might have looked like in, in some of the re reconstruction stuff, um, actually, in particularly in the, the late period, um, <coughs> not a clear sense of how Coalbridge had developed, and certainly not the ability to re-inquire of its collection. So, we put together a, an interim uh, research framework, which similar to what Lucy was saying yesterday, you know, came up with the usual long list of targets. Um, but we we focused that down into some quite specific uh, areas, specifically because we were doing an interpretation project. So we were looking to see what we could extract for this project, rather than necessarily what the long-term academic research parameters might be. So we were we were interested in. Uh, the sort of the character of the town. We're interested in its transition from military to civilian. We're interested in the transition late on into what appears very much an industrial site. We were interested in how we could look at the physical uh, uh, character of the place. And we adopted three sort of approaches to dealing with that. One was to look at the archive material. One was to conduct a massive piece of redocumentation on the collection, and one was to look at the landscape, wider landscape archaeology. So if we look at the archive, that work entailed a rereading of a huge amount of literature, published and unpublished material. It involved sort of cross-referencing everything that anyone had ever said and trying to get right back to the origins of what the initial piece of evidence was, which then led to those Chinese whispers. So if someone says something, someone interprets a particular piece of evidence from that and presents it in a different way. Someone else logs that and says, well, that's clearly the truth bit, and takes that to substantiate another piece of writing. But actually, if you go back to the key piece of evidence, it doesn't suggest the end outcome. We also see quite a lot of... Um, a circular argument going on whereby something that's determined at the coal bridge is used as a point of evidence to demonstrate a wider frontier wide chronology and once you've done that and that chronology becomes quite embedded it then of itself reinforces the initial piece of evidence apparently that came from coal bridge round and round we go try to break into those circles is the difficult thing um, it also involved, I should say, a lot of sort of searching of different archives around the country for those, those uh, original photographs, which became key as well to actually verifying what some of the written evidence seemed to be telling us. Am I doing all right for time? I have no long idea how long uh, this will take. About 15 minutes. That's Very good. Questions. Excellent. So that re-evaluation of the primary archive came up with some sort of macro stuff, which was to do with sequencing and broad chronology, particularly in the, 20, uh, in the second century, uh, and telling us about the sort of makeup of the, of the later fourth century town. But it also involved micro uh, sort of uh, views in at specific narratives, one of which is our pottery shop. Get there eventually. Um, 1907, uh, they start excavating in what later became understood as really the center, the core of the town. Uh, this is the building uh, known as called Site 20, uh, typical of one of these long, narrow plots that line the roadsides of, of, of the later settlement. Uh, it's lesser town, Corbridge, really, as it's just an extended roadside settlement. Um, and Leonard Woolley, before it was he, um, later Sir Leonard Woolley for, Woolley for his um, services in Mesopotamia, he carries out the 1907 excavation, and he gives us this plan of this strip building, where he says that uh, there's a very clear clay floor, which is heavily burned, and above it is a, a, a deposit, again, of uh, burnt clay and ash, and within that is a whole stack of pottery, which can be, to some extent, uh, sort of sectioned off of how it, how it was broadly found within the space. Um, Woolley uh, looks 
at. He's, he's seen as a, a, a really methodical excavator, a very careful recorder, and certainly what we have of his would seem to prove that. <coughs> he's also known as a good storyteller. So he sees all this pottery, and he says, we've got a pottery shop here. Uh, I can relate the level of the clay floor to the roads outside, and it looks like it's <coughs> relatively late, and I found some coins here, and they're clearly the coins from the till. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Which is published um, by his site supervisor successor, uh, R. Forster, or Forster um, who's a local archaeologist um, who seems to disagree with Woolley and not necessarily seems to have liked him very much. So Forster decides, I should say, here's a photograph which we largely understand as being something of a staged photograph showing uh, clusters of pottery uh, merrily placed where they supposedly were found. Um, anyway, here's Forster. He doesn't particularly get on with Woolley. Publishes his account faithfully in 1907, but three years later, uh, in a talk to uh, South of Antiquaries, uh, uh, states a different account, which he later, later publishes. And he tries to, he says it's a pottery shop, but he dates it on the same end. And he dates the same end to be late second century, so it's a late second century pottery shop. And therefore the burnt floor layer, and this is critical, uh, becomes late se second century, and that becomes part of the things that the Edwardians really wanted to give us, which was this destruction deposit which goes all the way across Colbridge, and is this sort of event horizon between everything that goes before, everything that comes after, and helps us to date and sequence all sorts of stuff, as well as uh, confirming the idea of barbarians revolting uh, in the north of England, somewhere around 180 to 196, I think is the, is the common, common bracket. Uh, so thanks to that, Forster, Ian Richmond then decides to confuse things even more in 1940 by reopening the site and declaring that uh, most of that building we were looking at was in fact the remains of a temple, because he was desperate to have a temple complex, because that substantiated the idea of a good civilian town. Excellent. Um, interestingly, though, he also seems to have recovered a lot of the Mortaria, which the Edwardians had dumped in a pit, rather than saving. And he said, oh, this Mortaria is interesting. Looks like fourth century stuff to me. So, we're all a bit murky. Um, by looking at all this stuff again, by going out on site with your level and actually recalibrating different floor levels, etc., we can come to a, a number of conclusions. One is um, interesting that Forster thought it was second century, uh, supposing then that this site in the middle of Corbridge Town lay abandoned for the next 200 years. Uh, secondly, that um, by retesting the levels, we can indeed say that the clay floor level was a very late. Uh, feature. Uh, we can say that with the Mortaria dating the court and the coin dating, that substantiates that idea of, uh, of a late thing. But the nature of the Samian uh, is not the sort of thing you find in the shop, but it's the sort of thing you find in an heirloom collection, personal heirloom collection. It's a very limited range of material of cups and bowls, so that might well have been in this building when it burnt down. But if you also look at the courseware of the Mortaria, it's not the sort of uh, broken assemblage that has come from falling off uh, Woolley's wooden shelves. It's not whole pots, it's just a scatter of material. So it's not a pottery shop, and it's probably uh, a burning event of somewhere around 367 or later. Um, so the collection, I haven't run out of time, brilliant. Um, the collection, as I said, it's huge. It was largely inaccessible. It was deeply problematic. There were 4,000 catalogued entries at the start of this project. There's now 65,000, I think, uh, thanks to volunteers, largely, brilliant team. Um, what that does, obviously, is give us a good deal more access. And I should say what we've particularly done, we've done that documentation in order to recontextualise material, in order to tie that material as much as possible back to that primary archive. So an example of this is in the Samian. So 126 boxes of Samian that was not sorted by form, by potter, by date, or by context. Um, but most of it had some level of contextual information with it, either Edwardian, 1930s, or Corbett School. So we now have 12,500 catalogued uh, groups of Samian representing somewhere near 30,000 sherds. And it allows us, if we go back to that destruction deposit, 
it allows us to reapply this material to these multiple areas of burning which are found across the site and which have been tied together to make a single event. It's preliminary stuff, but it does suggest that a lot of these burning areas are absolutely not contemporary. So the more we get into this, um, we've been able to put the, the, the Samian on the sort of global Samian database as well. We found some lovely new stamps and some lovely new graffiti. Why has it just done that? Because I'm an idiot, possibly. Let me just scroll back to there. Oh, God. Excellent. Right. All that's lovely. Uh, for an archaeologist, there's nothing better than uh, digging in the archive and getting carried away for weeks on end. Um, what does it do in terms of this idea of assertive archaeology? It is perhaps assertive simply because it challenges, because it asks questions and it doesn't <coughs> accept the status quo. It's assertive um, or it's positive because it's, it's unlocked lots of other engagement, lots of other partnership possibility. Um, we now have a coin, a PhD, uh, focusing on the corporate coins. We have, uh, where's Dan? We have the ability, finally, to get John Dawes' type series of the courseware that he started back in the 80s to fruition and get that, hopefully, into your standardised uh, formatting. That's wonderful. We've partnered up with uh, Newcastle University and Alice's point yesterday about that idea of longevity of curator and academic and getting to know each other and having a period of time pays off here because we're able through Francis McIntosh, our curator, to work with Ian Haynes to get them to come out and do an astonishing piece of geophysics. In the yellow you can see what the Edwardian, the extent of the Edwardian recovery. Um, that sort of work allows us to reinterpret, um, you know, Corbridge as a early fourth century settlement. It allows us, with Graham's work on archive, to think more securely, more confidently about the shape and disposition of buildings. It allows us to think about hmm, what might the industrial act activity actually have been on this site? What can we be definite about? It allows us to think about the elevations of these buildings. This is, you know, 1 to 50 stuff based directly on the footprints of these buildings that we're starting to be able to measure out and plot along the main high street, which turns into really lovely um, illustrative work by a chap called Lyndon Haynes, who's London-based. I would absolutely recommend working with him. Lovely bloke. Uh, very, very respectful of what we, what we wanted. And things like this become core of that new presentation. So I'm now able to go, look, I'm so proud we have a new, new museum. Um, that kind of work on the core archive gives you confidence to talk about your site in your interpretation. It gives you confidence not just to say, oh, there was a fault, and then there was another fault, and then there was another fault, which previously took up half of the old exhibition, just going through the phases of faults, with a little bit about, oh, yeah, and then some people lived there afterwards. It allows you to, to shrink the faults actually down to about two panels, because what Corbett is fascinating for is a sense of longevity, a sense of how people are actually living through the great turmoil of the Roman period and how they respond and react to it. So that, it's only by doing that piece of work, even if it doesn't actually give you all the answers, and let's face it, Corbridge is never going to give us anything definite, however much we study it, unless we excavate the whole of that damn field where the geophysics was. Um, but it gives you a confidence, a confidence of tour. It allows you to use ceramics as a 25 metre to long timeline and see how they sort of weft and wane over the period and what that might tell you. It allows you something else, I'm sure. Uh, it allows you to commission people to make really beautiful mounts for large bits of stonework, um, which, is, which is good. It encourages Limbury Trust to give you 275 grand for your trouble, which is nice of them. Um, oh, there's the hoard, looking lovely. Um, thank you. Well, I think we can deal with that. Um, I put this in this morning for Peter, having chatted last night. Um, here's... Uh, Get the right one. Here's uh, Mercury. I think this one's going up the other side. Anyway, that's Victory. I don't know. Um, we 3D scanned them, or rather, Sheffield Hallam as a sort of research project 3D scanned them, and Peter, we then printed them. And there's a little interactive where you can put these pieces back together, and written on the different pieces are their different attributes. 
what makes them a victory on Mercury. So you can pop it all back together and they're all magnetised. And what I really liked was one of the first kids to use it, completely jettisoned the idea of uh, putting them together properly and just wanted to play, and that was perfect. Yeah. Um, briefly then, it does a little more than this, the archaeology. I've mentioned to volunteers that we had some fantastic work out in the community in this repacking of these ridiculous numbers of Sarian shirts. But it's also genuinely made the town and the museum start talking to each other. And the town is trying to set itself up as a kind of honeypot, a kind of jewel in the Tyne Valley. And it wants this site to be successful in order to generate that kind of cultural visit. We're able to you know, get involved. The curator is now part of the partnership looking after the station, a community partnership to look after the railway station. That's great. And the TIC. We do the food fairs and the Christmas markets. We appear on the websites. The archaeology and the sort of new <coughs> excitement about the potential of the archaeology has got the town hooked and they're looking for new stuff. They want periodic new material coming out of this process. So it's not a dead idea. We're now working with partners to create that research framework over the next 10 to 15 years, which looks at, well, okay, what is actually possible with Coalbridge if we really had the money and the endeavor? Yeah, well, if we do that research and we do that work, you never know, one day we might find a coffee shop. Thank you very much. <laughs>